Andy White, welcome back to Noise11.com. What's this I hear about you saying that you're leaving? Is that for good? Goodbye and good luck. Yeah. I've been here for a long time, Paul. I mean, I haven't been here all the time because I've been touring and and going back to Ireland every so often. But, yeah, I'm going to go back for an extended period. And it's not goodbye forever, but it's definitely goodbye and good luck. And I'll see you maybe the middle of next year. I've got to come back for well, there's various things I've got to come back for. But uh, I'm go- I haven't been away back home in Ireland for as long a period of time as this for ages and ages. Wow. Okay. So that's uh, that's quite the adventure that you're going on for 2025. Not just Ireland. There's also um, the Italian tour coming up on that too. Yeah. There's a couple of things. Of t- I mean, for starters, I mean, you'll have talked to musicians my age, and uh, my mum and dad are s- still going, which is great. But they're really old now, and I remember coming to Australia and thinking, I have never met people really in their 90s like I did when I first came to Australia. There's a friend of mine's mum was still going out. You know, in Ireland, it's pretty rare to be that old, to be honest. And in Australia, it's not that rare. But yeah, my mum and dad are getting on for sure. And I should go back. Like, my dad never says things like in movies, which dads say to their sons. But he did say, Andrew, because he calls me Andrew, you've got to spend some more time with your mother, and that would be a pleasure for me as well. I'd love to do that. So that's one of the main reasons I'm going back, is to spend time with mum. Because uh, it's a very far away for me from Belfast, really, here. Mm. And also, there's a musical thing I'm going to do, which I'll tell you about for sure. Oh, tell me about it right now, then. Well... Yeah, Paul, I guess, yeah, I haven't told anybody, I suppose it's an exclusive, except Brian on it, off the record, of course, who I've, I've, I've told about. But uh, last year I went to Abbey Road Studios in London and recorded for a day there with my great friend and record producer, John Leckie. Uh, we went in and I just played a live set on my own with my guitar in the famous Abbey Road Studio 2. And that's gonna come out as a live record next year, like about next May. So for me to be in the UK and Ireland, when it comes out for an extended period of time is good. Because uh, John just said, he's been to loads of my shows and he said, Andy, I wanna be able to buy at the end of the show a, a record which has got your live set as you play it live without a band or anything. I just want to have a solo CD of yours, uh, all your best songs, and let's go and record it in the best studio in the world. So that's what we did. That's amazing. So with, uh, you say a live record, but a live without an audience. Live record. Uh, we asked in the afternoon, there wasn't an audience, and then we asked friends in in the evening. So there's a little, you're not allowed to have a, like a whole concert in Abbey Road unless you pay a vast amount of money to do so. But uh, you can ask uh, friends in. So we had a, we had friends and family really arrived. And so half of it's like in the afternoon, I'm just playing on my own in the studio. And then in the evening, I, I guess there might be two CDs. I'm not quite sure. They sound, yeah, John's mixing, mixing them at the moment. So yeah, uh, there was an element of, an element of his is an actual show and the other bits just playing in this really rather beautiful surroundings. Wow, that's going to be quite special. Was it also filmed? Will there be a TV special that comes out of it as well? <laughs> well, my son and a friend of his were filming the whole time on their phones and so there will be an element. Again, if it's going to be an Abbey Road thing, it costs an absolute fortune to do like a whole thing I wouldn't be able to afford to do that but uh, John started working there in 1969 and knows them really well so we we were able to do what we liked but we couldn't actually film the whole thing but what we did there is a record of it on film for sure and uh, you know you'll have seen photos from that studio many many times Uh, when you go into it the thing which really 
gets you is the smell and the fact that everything there is the same as it was in 1966. And John said that, John said, you've got to smell it and just like take this all in because it's exactly the same. It's just been really well looked after. The machines, some of them have been uh, upgraded, obviously, in the control room, but the actual studio room itself is exactly the same as it was. So no doubt you went outside to the uh, pedestrian crossing and did the walk across, you got your photo taken. Oh, it's great, of course. Well, there's, you've got to queue up. I mean, if you want to know right now what is happening in Abbey Road on that crossing, there's a camera on it all the time. So if you're ever if you're ever late night in Australia thinking, oh, I wonder what's happening in Abbey Road, then you can actually look and see what it is, and it'll be queues of people queuing up to um, walk across the road. I was uh, amazed uh, when I was there, um, literally that it is a major traffic uh, road in yeah. London. And as you've got all these people, it must be like hundreds of people a day walk across yeah. there and get their photo taken like the Beatles Abbey Road album cover. Buses, yeah. taxis, cars are coming up and down the road and they have to stop so everyone can get their photo off. Yes, everybody. Because it's actually to... a real pedestrian crossing. It's a real one, yeah. And the, the bus driver, imagine if you're on that route, you know, there's going to be, you know, well, it's going to be fun. Like every day there'll be like tourists going across it looking, looking, laughing and having a good time. Beatles are all about good time, but, you know, Beatles forever. Beatles is about love and having fun. And uh, that's what it's like when you're there. Like the whole thing is, it's like that right now, as we speak, there'll be somebody on Abbey Road. Absolutely. Crossing it. Yeah. yeah. Look, let's talk about uh, the new album, uh, Good Luck, I Hope You Make It. What, a, what an apt title for an album considering uh, what America has been through this week. Right. Good luck, I hope you make it. It's yeah. like, well, you've got the tone of it then because in Ireland if you're saying, Paul, good luck with that, you know, it's not just wishing you luck for something, it's, but it's like you have to you have a sort of intake of breath. And yeah, sure, the American thing's just nuts, really. But who could have seen it coming? I don't know. Um, I'm just, I'm just like open mouthed at it. But uh, good luck. I hope you make it. it was like it's a phrase that just came up. I promised my son I wouldn't say that this album was written in lockdown, but I've got, I've got to be tell the truth. And it was written in lockdown. I didn't start it in lockdown. I came back from Britain and Ireland. Um, Brexit was about to happen. Um, Australia was on fire when I came back, like it was really bad. The Invasion Day protests were happening. And I was starting to write a record wondering if I could react to what's going on at the moment where I'm living the same kind of way as I reacted to growing up in Belfast in the 80s, which was pretty heavy and which formed the basis of my first record really. and. Little was I to know that everything that was going to happen in 2020 was going to go onto the new record. And the upshot of all that is good luck. I hope you make it or we make it because we went through a lot those couple of years. I don't think if we, I, d I think we tend to push it away and think, oh, we got through it. But actually, we went through quite a lot, hmm. all of us. And the stories within the album uh, are described as beat poetry. Um, so it's interesting, you know, uh, you're telling me before about going to see Bob Dylan uh, last year. Yeah. So beat poetry would, I guess, uh, refer back to the Dylan era. Um, he yeah, probably... in the basement, mixing up the medicine. I'm on the pavement thinking about the government, the man in the trench coat, bad job laid off, says he's got a bad cough, wants to get it paid off. Look at kid do matter what you did. You know, that is beat poetry. That's what it is. It's like Chuck Berry and Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac. Bob Dylan was in that world. And that was the world which really excited me about words, poetry, music, like it, like uh, come together, dig it, um, John Lennon, you know, all those things really excited me when I was a kid. And they still do actually tell you the truth. So Absolutely, yes. And I went back to that world thinking I'd love to do a spoken rec word record as well, because that's kind of how I started off when I was about 20. 
mm. all those years ago. Yeah, so I started off really writing and performing poetry with a bass guitar. I didn't really play an acoustic guitar like a folk singer for a, until a few years later. I would get up and play before punk bands in Belfast because punk was the big thing in Belfast, really. And um, yeah, that's where my poems kind of grew into acoustic songs. But uh, for this new record, I thought, right, I'm going to I'm going to go right back to the start. Also, because there's only me, there's only I couldn't have a band. It was just me at home. Uh, mm. So Bob so Dylan's the, really the original rapper, isn't he? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that 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 uh, too much monkey business is really amazing. Um, the Last Poets are really great if you want to listen to them. Gil Scott Heron, I love Gil Scott Heron. He was, uh, but Bob, Bob knew the value of words and had read so much poetry, so much um, spoken word stuff. Like, yeah, and he's like a genius lyrically. So, yeah, of course. Hmm. So, rather simple in that you know it's pretty much only you, but then you go and complicate things by recording in Melbourne, mixing in Calgary, mastering in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, uh, we're we're off to the UK at some point in this story. Um, you know, the the to to actually go from what you've created in Melbourne to getting it out and around the world basically involved people all around the world. Yeah, well, it's great. You can connect like we're doing now, like. You just have to take the position you're in and really use what you can to do what you want to do. And that's kind of that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah, so it went from being in a tiny little studio in Melbourne, in the hills, to all over the world. And uh, that's kind of what I've been doing with my music the last few years. Like, I love the way it can, it can spread like that very, very quickly. So it went from a, a very tiny perspective to really a huge perspective. Uh, pretty quickly. Mm. You've worked with some fascinating people over the years, uh, including Peter Gabriel. Uh, recall your time with Peter. Oh, uh, yeah, that was amazing. Well, I put out a record called Out There, which, in fact, you started asking me about America. There's a song on that called Speechless. I've been singing at concerts recently about the first time I went to America and one of the Gulf Wars starting. There were, like, two things about America left me speechless one with absolute joy and excitement and again going back into that beat world of uh traveling across america on a bus with a band to the political involvement in the middle east which really hasn't ended since then yeah. um now there's that whole record out there had a lot of stories on it songs and i somehow got it to peter gabriel i knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody and i'd been a really big fan of his his for forever really and he just really liked it and he's got a very uh even view of uh the caste system of music is weird like it's really hard to talk to somebody who's on a very much higher level than you or you probably don't talk to somebody who's a much lower level than you unless you meet somebody as cool as peter gabriel who shows you the way to do it and i hope i've copied the way he's taught people around him to be which is to treat everybody absolutely the same and so when i got out there to him uh he asked me to um, play at one of his womad festivals and i started to play a lot of them that's one of the first times i came to australia was playing in a womad festival in adelaide but there are lots of them there's about 12 or 15 all over the world not every year but there were at that time and after the English WOMAD festival, Peter would ask the people who played the festival to come back to his studio, his recording studio, which is called Real World Studios in Bath, near Bath, in Box, actually, in Wiltshire. It's called Box, the village. And so all of the people from the festival went back to the studio and collaborated together and wrote and recorded. And he really opened up his place for like a week after each of the English Womads. And that's where I met him first. And that's where I was there. And actually, Tim was there as well. Tim Finn, you and I have talked mm. together uh, with Tim. And I was writing with Tim at the time. And Peter asked us to take part in this writing uh, of a project he was doing called Big Blue Ball. And a song came out of that called Whole Thing which is a really amazing song. It's a huge production on Peter's record, Big Blue Ball. 
I put it on my record called Teenage, a really simple version of it. And uh, that was that was a big connection with him and that'll always be a connection with him. So that was it was a beautiful experience. It was amazing to to have Peter Gabriel playing A minor and G minor, then writing some words. Tim writing a melody, I wrote the words, we gave it to Peter and suddenly it becomes a Peter Gabriel song as soon as he opens his mouth. Like it's he's just got total star quality as soon as he sings whatever he's gonna sing. Wow. I had no idea that Peter Gabriel was the reason that you made it to Australia to live. It was one of the reasons, yeah. It was writing with Tim and Liam. Liam who was in Hot House Flowers. And Hot House Flowers were really successful in Australia and he told me a lot. I've, I've shared an apartment with Liam in Dublin and um, Tim came to stay with us and we became out. And then Tim asked us back to Melbourne, to Caulfield, where he lived at the time and he had a studio. And we recorded an album called Altitude in Caulfield. And that was the very first time I came to Australia. And then the second time was to play with Alt as part of WOMAD, WOMAD Lead. And we saw Nusrat Fat Ali Khan, saw Jaw Wobbles, Wobbles, Invaders of the Heart. Like it was amazing. Adelaide, if you've just arrived in Australia, you can't believe. Like the musical scene at that time was very, very good. You've got uh, November 14, I think, if I've got the date correct, to uh, November of 14, one more show. Goodbye. A goodbye. Yeah, it's a bit of a goodbye to Melbourne. It's a tiny show in a beautiful place called Mary Creek Tavern in Northcote. And really just come along, um, tell stories. I'll do some of the spoken word with backtracks. I'll play my acoustic guitar. I'll play any songs of mine you want me to play if I can remember the lyrics. And it's so tiny, I won't be able to pretend not to hear you ask. So, yeah, you're very welcome. I'll, I hope it'll be a fun, friendly evening. Well, good to talk to you, Andy. And, uh, well, people can jump on and have a listen to uh, the new album, Good Luck I Hope I Make It, before they go to your show. Okay, great. Thanks so much.